All right, guys, I've been away. I moved house. Um, it's been about three weeks since I last did a video, so I thought I would do an upload. I've got a bit of spare time. So today we're going to get into the Sony PST-1, which was part of the uh, the bundle that I picked up locally. Maybe last month, I think it was now. Don't really know the condition of this. I've got a nice new cartridge to fit to it and all the rest of the stuff. So let's get it apart, open it up and see what we got. So in opening up then, it's already got the transit bolts removed. Uh, I did that in the previous video. And the, strangely, there's a couple of capacitors in there. I'm not entirely sure if they've come out of this. And there's a little transistor there as well. I don't know if they've come out of this or the amplifier that came with it, but we'll see. It came with the original manual, which is pretty cool. On this instruction manual. It's not often that you find a manual in original condition with something. And especially in the box as well, so that's, that's pretty cool. Nice little bonus. Pretty grubby pair of RCAs there, marked Sony Japan. Reasonably well built, but minging. And we have our standard fair 70s grey power cable, along with a really nice MK Bakelite plug. I appreciate plugs, I don't know if anybody else does, it's got brass screws, nice. So as I said before, this is a PST1 turntable. It is direct drive and it is a bit of the the lower end of direct drive shall we say the cover is in good nick tone arms in good nick generally it's in good nick the springs don't seem to like to hold up the lid which is a little bit unusual so i'll remove that just to get it out of the way and then we'll look at the springs later first thing i want to remove is this xl15 cartridge the stylus is kaput so we can change the cartridge. I'll probably just pull the entire head shell off to be honest with you, just to, just to save a bit of time. Head shell's the original Sony, which is nice and in good nick. XL15. I've already had a look at the stylus under a microscope and there is uh, no needle on the end of it. But the cabling is there so we can refit a new cartridge and get it all aligned later. For the rest of it then the tone arm rest is there which is unusual I always find. And uh, the rest of the tone arm base itself is in pretty good condition. A few little scratches here and there but generally not bad. If we come across to the uh, the plat itself then, I'm not sure if this is paint or it's just been marked. I think that's actually parcel tape. So we'll uh, get into removing all that and give it a good clean. Also have the original Sony 45 adapter, which is cool. Looks like it's been 3D printed, but definitely hasn't. We have a very basic anti-skate there and the lift arm is quite fragile actually. I'm gonna remove the, uh, the weight from the torn arm. We can get the scales out later and calibrate the torn arm. Decent condition as well. The letters have just nicely yellowed, which I'm quite happy with. I just realised I said calibrate the torn arm. What I meant is they uh, sort our tracking weight out. One thing I do like to test to see if it's uh, stuck or anything is the, uh, the torn arm lift there. So if I lay it down, it seems to be dropping quite nicely. Next up is our slip mat, or whatever you want to call it. Original Sony, pretty good condition. And then we'll remove the platter by basically pulling straight up. And there's our platter. Not very heavy in comparison to some of the Technics ones. Really not that heavy at all. Maybe half the weight of a, a 1200, I think. Next up then, I've refitted the lid and just flipped it over and it just allows it to sit on the lid with a bit of cushion in there as well so you don't make any more scratches and then we're going to take all these screws out i suspect this knot might need to come out for the uh, for the central drive but we'll see as we go and sent them 12 13 14 screws there's no need for 14 screws at all the uh the dampening feet are in reasonable condition as well the rubber's intact so inside we've got a pretty basic power supply our board that I'll have an inspect for any dry solder as well. Some basic controls on the front, like your power controls and whatnot. We have our torn arm and its control because it is an automatic return. And then we've also got what looks like not sure what that is. 
I don't know why it's there, it's not earth to anything. And then we've got our connections for our RCAs and our earth lead. Everything is literally uh, really good. All this grease is, is still greasy. Um, that it's not turned to clay or anything. So we're good for that. I think what I might do is um, give the platter a bit of a, a clean and a grease more than anything. I think that everything in this side looks absolutely perfect. Even this dampening felt isn't even dirty. I, I really think this has had absolute minimal use. So it might just be a bit of a simple clean and back together for this one. There's a couple of rotary switches I want to clean out and then we'll take it from there. So it's difficult to see but our main rotary switch is down there. I'm going to have to basically take those two screws out and get some deoxid in it just out of routine. This piece of trim just comes away. Which gives us great access to this rotary switch. I'm going to give that a good clean now. Happy days. And just work all that deoxid in. All right, so after a quick review of the service manual, what we're going to do is get a smaller screwdriver, first of all. And we're going to remove the play switch, which is two smaller screws, and not lose those. And then this should give us a little bit of freedom because this uh, motorboard and the motor itself all comes out in one go. It comes over and flips over like that. So if we just remove these four screws, then I think with some cutting of these, there's cable ties everywhere as well, we should be able to remove the motor completely don't forget this one is an earth point as well over here. We should be able to remove the mortar board itself completely, flip it over, and then we should be able to clean and grease the, uh, the spindle. And this is heavy and delicate at the same time. There's a little plastic clip down here. Got cable ties snipped. There's one, two, three, and there's a little Sony bendy thing that they like to hold cables down with. Should give us enough leverage to flip this over. And here we have in all its prime, a pretty basic direct drive motor. Uh, one, two, three, four, Four caps. The little transistors seem to match the ones that are in that bag. So I'm going to have a look, see if these have been resoldered. It seems a little bit odd if they have. If they haven't, I might just replace them anyway after testing those. But this uh, is basically a case of just pulling this up, avoiding touching these windings, and there we go. Pretty clean. To be honest, they're definitely in need of a, a, a bit of a reorient. So as I said, you have individual windings there. It's not really protected very well and it's really not done to any sort of expense. This was the base turntable unit when it came out and you can see why, I think, to be honest with you. So let's uh, clean out this bearing down in there. Bush, maybe, bearing, I'm going to go bush. Clean it out, reoil. Same with the shaft, and then we can reassemble and have a look at these transistors and caps. So with some basic IPA and a cloth then, we're going to clean the end of this shaft up. Pretty clean if I'm honest with you. Um, not too bad. It has a, a, a ball on the end, a ball bearing, which is quite a snazzy way of reducing friction as it's sat on the, the bottom of the bush there. I quite like that. Minimal friction due to this ball. Good engineering. So upon inspection of the uh, the caps and the transistors that I found in the box, these appear to have already been used. Looking at the legs, they've definitely got solder on them. So at some point, someone's replaced these four parts. I'm not sure why. 
But once we get it span up and cleaned and sorted, hopefully it won't point to a bigger problem. If not, some at least has had a go at repairing it already. So next thing, good old fashioned audio repairmans or repair them or repair persons. Uh, cleaning tool is the old cotton swab and some IPA. And this is actually coming out almost immaculate. Which is not bad. I honestly think this has had absolutely no use over its time. That is clean oil on the bottom of that. So we'll give it a, a dry with the other side and then we'll with my favourite slug slime. You don't need much, especially the way that the shaft's designed. So I'm going to re-oil this then is I'm going to apply a reasonable amount. I'm going to apply a reasonable amount to the ball on the bottom there and then also some on the shaft at the top and bottom not too much it's essentially sewing machine oil and then avoiding those windings simply let it find its own place just like that like so there we go, and not forget to put our uh, earth cable back on there when we're re-screwing it down because that would be silly now that's down, I presume these cables are supposed to be kept out of the way Sony love these bendy rubber stick things don't they they're on most of their tape decks to keep cables out of the way the rest of the stuff, I'm happy with its positioning actually we just need to reseat this, uh, this play switch I've just done another look to make sure that everything is fine as it is and doesn't need stripping and re-greasing and all of the toenail mechanism is absolutely spotless. The grease is still liquid, it's totally fine. I'm not going to strip this entire toenail down and replace it when I'm, I'm happy with where it is. There's not even any dust inside it or muck or anything. So I'm happy with that. The main thing I wanted to do, especially with direct drive turntables, is to just oil that centre bearing and bush or shaft or whatever's on your, your direct drive turntable. and. The rotary switch is a standard thing. There is some uh, pots here that you can adjust to fine tune the speed if it's not coming up trumps. So if we don't get the right speed with this, perhaps we can adjust these pots to get the speed we want. So just uh, one special little thing I want to mention on this is this turntable. It's quite unusual really. Is What it has underneath the platter there is essentially a magnetic, almost like a tape head and it measures the speed through this because the inside of the platter is magnetized. So if we have a look inside the platter, we'll just knock it on. Look at the uh, the ferrous coating. Look at the difference in color on the outside. So that ferrous coating, if I can make it focus, is what that head's picking up. See it? So before we put this back on, same as you would any cassette head, I'm gonna give that a little bit of that IPA and a clean. Just a very little gentle clean. There's nothing on it to be honest with you. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty fine as it is. But you know why not? There's a couple of little bits of dust around it, but and this will allow it to know what speed it's doing at all times. Now we're ready to put everything back together. So next thing's for the platter, which as you can see is. A little bit of minging and my trick for this on this side it's a little bit cleaner is just a dry scouring pad and then just go around the outside and very lightly don't press too hard you don't have to do it too much and you'll get that shine back again just takes the oxidation off the top all right now that is gleaming just like the 70s so let's just pop that back on top it just sits on top not that it doesn't pop down as a Technics one because the uh, the magnet and whatnot isn't attached to the plat and then we'll give this a bit of a clean still a little bit damp there we'll dry it once it's on makes it a lot easier I'm not a fan of rubber 
uh, platinum mats, if I'm honest with you. There's a lot of rubbish come off that though. That's pretty bad. I'm not a fan of rubber platinum mats, to be honest with you. I prefer cork, but I'm going for originality today. And then we'll give this a bit of a wipe down and a clean and give it a test. So this might require a little bit of explanation. On the side there, you'll notice it says 60 hertz and 50 hertz. 45 is the top one. 33 is the second one down. This is if you have 60 hertz power supplies in your house, which isn't the UK. This is America and I can't list all the countries, but Google it. But in the UK, we have 50 hertz. So if you're running at 45, you're going to be looking at this line, which is the third one down, as it's illustrated there. If you're looking at for 33, we're looking at the bottom one, just above my manicured fingernail there. So when I start this up, this lamp will flash at 50 hertz because that's it's been supplied by our power supply in the wall. And if we can just move that shadow, hopefully we can achieve a stable speed. So if I just move the tone arm across, this lamp is flashing at 50 hertz. And what we're looking for is to try and get that bottom line stable when I adjust the pitch control. So we're really slow there. So when I speed it up, it should stabilize just like that. So as you can see at the bottom there, you can kind of see the uh, the black outlines of the platter. The speed of those black marks is matching the speed that this light is flashing, which is 50 hertz. So 50 hertz. 50 hertz that's a stable 33 speed so let's try 45 if i can find a button without looking so i'll put 45 on which should change it and we're looking at the next one up now which is the second one and that's a little bit fast so if i turn that down a little bit oh no that's a little bit slow if i speed it up a little bit that's so stable at 45 lovely and go back to uh, 33 and see if i can make that Settle itself down again. Wunderbar. Let's get this cartridge swapped out and we can listen to some sweet Huey Lewis. So for anybody that's never changed a cartridge before, uh, this piece here is the cartridge. This is the stylus. And uh, it's held in place with these two screws. And on the back of the cartridge is four wires. And they are colour coded. So they are left and right signal, left and right ground. They are quite easy to get the wrong way around and quite easy to mess up and cause all sorts of issues but basically if you look down that way at what's going into your torn arm it should be the same level over here except swapped so you notice on the back there we've got green and blue on this side it's blue then green but on the say same level top level green and blue top level green and blue bottom level red and white on this end white then red so we're going to pull these plugs out unscrew this cartridge put a new one in put the plugs in and then we have to align it as well so there's a couple of ways you can do this the simplest way really is to uh, just basically push them if they're not too tight or you can get a really fine set of needle nose pliers and pull them but i find that actually damages the uh, the cable so if you're not replacing the cables and you want to reuse them I would suggest the push method but if you don't care then for all I care you could use a, a you know, plumber's pipe wrench to do it if you want so now they're out we'll just unscrew these screws in the top weirdly instead of nuts they have these really strange they are nuts but why do they need to be of this design why can't it just be nuts it's just I don't understand that. Is there a reason for that? Let me know in the comments. Alright, so the cartridge we're using after screwed into place, I believe, is an 8091 Audio Technica. Uh, reasonable kind of starter level cartridge, pretty good views throughout. And uh, I've just put some kind of beefier screws in there basically, just to spike it, uh, spice it up a little bit. So you want it kind of pretty loose, uh, enough that you can move it backwards and forwards. So I'm going to put these wires back in place first as to where they need to go and then what we will do is we'll position the cartridge uh, this way left and right as a rough guide it's i think it's 52 mil from here to the tip of the stylus off the top of my head but i'll give a google on that one and then we'll get the cables plumbed in 
and then we can put it kind of as straight as we can possibly get it and then we have to print out a piece of paper which will allow us to uh, align the cartridge correctly for playback. So what I've just done is I've done it off camera basically because all I'm doing is sliding this left and right and I've set the overhang which is the distance between this part where my fingernail is here where it connects to your torn arm and the stylus so for this particular turntable it is 52 mil so using my uh, handy dandy micrometer there what i'm looking for is 52 mil between the stylus tip at the bottom of your screen there and the top is where it meets your torn arm so that's 52 mil so and, and that's pretty straightforward all i've done is just slide it backwards and forwards so now that's done i know that this overhang is correct and all that needs to happen is when it's on the, the record player or turntable as we like to call it nowadays uh, is is the uh, the twisting adjustment because if it was straight on flat like that it wouldn't work it kind of has to turn and face the inside of the record when it's playing but for all intents and purposes that is as close to I'm looking for the cover that is uh, good for overhang and then when we get it in place on the torn arm, then we can align it properly left and right. And then we're done, that's it. So now we've got our new cartridge and uh, head shell fitted to the torn arm. Now we need to set up uh, our alignment and also we need to work out what weight we're putting down for this cartridge. I believe it's something like between 1.8 and 2.2 grams. As such, I've not actually put the weight on the back of the torn arm yet until I can find my scales. But some of you might have noticed that we have a lid that's staying up by itself. Hmm. And it stays up well. So a little bit of a tweak to the springs gives us exactly what we're looking for. And I'll show you what I did. It's a little unorthodox and at the moment it's a little bit scruffy. And basically what I did is just bent the end of the spring round to give it a bit more tension on both sides. So this was previously flat and I just bent it around a little bit more and it actually holds the hinges into the turntable a lot better. So because you kind of got this, this little nodule bit sticking out now that hold your hinges onto the turntable. So we'll get a bit of black paint and we'll just touch up that spring and it'll look factory fresh. So that's at least one really annoying thing sorted that I'm really happy with. So now we can take our torn arm weight and just fire that back on as well. But we don't really know what it's telling us yet. This black bit on the outside, um, you'll set that yourself. So when I find zero and it's totally balanced, I'll set it to zero. And then we should, in theory, be able to change that to uh, two and it should give us two grams of weight on the stylus. However, when you think about it, that was for the previous cartridge. So we need to make sure we measure it properly with a set of scales. All right, so we're getting towards the end of this now and we're on to cartridge alignment. So in order to align a cartridge to your turntable, you need what's called a protractor. And what that does is it ensures that no matter where this cartridge is in the, uh, when in the playback zone of a record, should we say, on the, the grooves of a record, it is exactly horizontal to the line of play, no matter where that is. So you might align it here. In actual fact, when it gets to the middle there, it's often skewed. And that can lead to problems with playback, such as sibilance, 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 go with sibilance, which is like the rolling of S's. So when someone's saying, yes, it can kind of sound longer and protracted. Um, inner groove distortion as well, because the inner groove has more information in it, it can cause distortion for the inner grooves. I and mean, some, some records are just like that anyway, if it's a poor pressing. But what we want to try and do is just get it as best as we can and we use a protractor for that. And there's loads available online and they're just a case of printing them out. Uh, now, what you, have to, what you do have to do is ensure that when you print out these, they're printed at 100% scale. Some of them have a little um, line on the side that says 15 centimetres and you should measure that and as long as that measures at 15 centimetres, you're good. So this is Audio Technica's one and this one basically doesn't have 
a scale on it, but I know this is printed 100% because I've just done it. And you cut out a hole there, stick that on your uh, platter, and then when you align your cartridge, it should be flat all the way along. As so. So that should be flat along with the grid lines and it should be aligned and the same as over there. Now you have to rotate it obviously because it's this is flat and this isn't. So that's an audio technical one. I think I might give that one a try as well. This is generally the one that everybody uses, the fluence one. Exactly the same. We'll cut this out, cut a hole and stick it on top there and then we'll align it. There is another one for Technics decks, which is specifically a Technics one. Now this one isn't really relevant for us, but I printed it just to see what it's going to look like because it relies on the distance between the center of your platter there and your uh, pivot point on your tone arm being uh, 215 millimeters. Now in this case it isn't, so I'm not going to use it, but I do use that one for my Technics decks. Um, that is generally the one to use, I believe, for Technics decks. And this arc here, which is quite convenient actually, gives you a bit of a feel as to whether you should or shouldn't be using this type of uh, protractor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cut out the Fluence one and the Audio Technica one that I've just put a T-ring on the bottom of it, but that's fine, I don't need that bit. We'll cut these out and then we'll have a bit of a look and see which one aligns the best and see if we can get the best possible alignment for this cartridge for playback. So I've got the Fluence one on there and I'm going to start at uh, the, the outermost point. And what you've got on the actual uh, protractor itself is you've got a little circle where you need to put your stylus right in the middle of it. Now obviously you are going to place your stylus on something that isn't a record. And you'd be very careful uh, that you are not going to knack your stylus. So very gentle and it needs to be dead on centre. So just a little bit of twe tweaking and then just double check from all your angles all right i'm dead on center there as you can see this cartridge actually needs twisting clockwise in order to bring the lines straight so if i just kind of adjust the camera angle you can see there that the cartridge is twisted and the line is not horizontally aligned with the cartridge so i'm going to adjust just one screw slowly twist it and see if i can get that lined up this is very difficult to do. Hold the camera and not touch the turntable because I don't want to knack on my stylus. So I apologise for it jumping about a little bit. But let's, uh, I'm going to adjust that screw on the right, give it a little twist, and hopefully I can get that line to appear straight. And then once we've done that one there, then we move on to the other one, and that should also be aligned. And then once you've got them both aligned, that's it. Okay, so... All I did there literally was undo one screw and give it a little bit of a twist and we are perfectly aligned with the horizontal if you look at the cartridge and the dotted line next to it and you can also check the side view as well as you can see the side view of the cartridge there aligns perfectly with the black line if I just move it it appears and disappears at the same rate so I'm happy in position B possibly I've done it in reverse but I don't care it should be the same anyway we now move back to position A, and it's very difficult to capture it on camera, but that is absolutely dead on on position A as well. And hopefully at the side, you can see that's perfectly aligned at the side. So our twist is good, and our position is good, and everybody's happy. So now, that cartridge is aligned, and everyone's happy. And yes, before anybody says, I, uh, I didn't get my scales out and test the, uh, the tracking force, Unfortunately, I did it yesterday. This is about three days into making this video. I did it yesterday and then I've took the scales home. I'm not at home at the moment. So basically, this is an AT3600L, which has a particularly high tracking force in grams. A lighter tracking force could damage your record. So I've just gone right in the middle of the manufacturer's specifications. So we have a aligned, correctly weighted cartridge, torn arm, the way it's correct, everything's good, and we're coming to the end. Let's stick a record on. I know I can't really play your record for the fact that I've got a copyright strike as soon as I go anywhere near it. But we'll give it a bit of a last wipe over, and then this one is ready to be used. Well, that's it for this one. Another piece of nice vintage audio equipment has been saved from who knows what. 
when I picked this up it had been in a cupboard locked away in its original box for a long long time and with anything you want to give it a once over to make sure you're getting everything out of it. As a matter of rule I like to change cartridges and styluses no matter what I do with the turntable and it's always nice to get fresh stuff on. So for now I'm going to sit back enjoy this LP of country rock which I've had for a significant amount of time, much longer than I care to remember, to be honest with you. But I've been listening to this now for a couple of days. I've tried different records on it. I've put lots of different bits and bobs on it, and it sounds perfect. It sounds exactly like I'd like it to. With the little modifications we've done, we've ensured that we know exactly what's going on with it. The hinges that are now fixed is a massive plus for me, to be honest with you. That was the one thing that was really annoying me. And everything coming out of this is just as expected. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have this turntable, hopefully you enjoy it as much as I do now. And if you like my videos, please like and subscribe. Something like 80% of my viewers aren't subscribed. And it really helps for my algorithm and my happiness if I get more subscribers. Have a great day. Bye bye.